after April the 6th, then what do we do <laughs> on Tuesday morning? Since you, if you're like me, well, five years I've been doing Tuesday mornings, it's kind of like, oh, it's Tuesday. I have to be in two, Route 260. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I mean I, I literally built well obviously my schedule would be a little bit unique but I built my life around that and so when there's not a Tuesday morning it's like something's wrong <laughs> so uh, but we need to think about that Teresa's out of town for a while uh, but uh, I have understanding that she thinks we're going to continue just to start again uh, we'll see, <laughs> and when, and all of that, and whether there would be childcare available in the summer, and there are some issues that have to be worked out, so uh, stay tuned for that, but that's why I wanted to get, uh, make sure that everybody has, I hope, correct information, and it also includes the information that the extra week Remember, we were going to have to take spring break because the schools um, closed down, the campuses closed down, we wouldn't be here on the 16th of March. Well, since we have Zoom, we'll do Zoom only, and, and that was made us able to add a little bit of time so that we have a little bit more we can cover in, in the apostles or in the letters. So, um, if you have questions about the the uh, calendar or uh, what's coming up, just let me know, and we will. Uh, you can email me, or you can ask here online, and and uh, we can find out. Okay, let's ask the Lord's blessing on us this morning. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Again, we do. We are so grateful for your provision, but most of all for your love and your care, your protection, the instruction from your mighty word that we can literally go to for our lives, to save our lives. Thank you for this instruction. Help us to glean the messages that you have for each one of us, where we are in our walk with you, Help us to understand what it is you're teaching us that we need to know as we abide in your word, according to your instruction, we abide in your word, and that gives us strength for life. Pray for those who are hurting this morning among us, those who need you the most. Pray for your close evidence of your peace and your protection and your presence in their lives. Bless us as we study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sometimes it helps us um, when we do Bible study if we look at words that are repeated in that book over and over and over like multiple, multiple times, it kind of gives us a clue what that book is about. So I did that for the book of Acts. What would you say is the word, and it's one word, not a phrase, but one word in the book of Acts that is repeated the most, the most times? It may be in connection with other words, but it's a single word. Close, but not quite. Anybody online can uh, unmute yourself and, and chime in, but what word in Acts is repeated the most times? Repent. Mm -hmm. Close, that's an often repeated, like believe, but not quite. Repent. What she said. No. Is it go? What's that? Go. 
go is mentioned often, but not nearly as much. I'm, I don't want to take a lot of time with this because nobody's going to guess this. I was totally dumbfounded when I looked it up. I have a software that will just record that word and, you know, how many times it occurs in that book or in the whole New Testament or whatever. God. 163 times God's name. The next one is Jesus. And it often refers in the, as a phrase, the name of Jesus, more times than not. That's 59 times. So that's not even half of the number. Uh, God is mentioned in association very often with the kingdom of God. And that's what I came down to. Uh, the Holy Spirit, we might as well get the third of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is 51 times. So what is the book of Acts about? God, the name of Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Almost always power is in the sentence that goes with Holy Spirit or the work of the Holy Spirit. So this is building the kingdom of God. And guess what? Acts 1-3 talks about them, uh, Jesus teaching them about the kingdom of God. And Acts 28, uh, the last verse in the very end of Acts is Paul went on teaching of the kingdom of God unhindered. So obviously we need to focus on the kingdom of God. And this is what we've talked about in the gospels and so forth. This is when God reigns in the hearts of his people. The kingdom is people. It's not really the church, although it could be the church is part of it because we are, the people are the church who are, uh, but we are in the kingdom <laughs> And it is not a place on earth. It is a spiritual um, dimension where, but the kingdom of God is what they were preaching. And it was the good news of the kingdom of God. And it's how to get into the kingdom of God and all of those things. So that's what I wanted to begin with when we look back and I, I kind of dipped back a little bit into week 45 last week. Uh, and I mentioned that in the, uh, in the calendar. We're, we're just gonna briefly look at chapter six. I'm just gonna go through them very quickly. If you just turn back a few pages in your um, uh, readings to 45, chapter uh, week 45, because week 46 begins with chapter nine, which we'll get to um, in Acts here pretty quick. But I wanted uh, to just read a couple in, in chapter six of Acts, we are. In those days, as the disciples were increasing in number, there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews. Just wanted to stop there for a minute. Hellenistic, anything Hellenized or Hellenistic is Greekized. <laughs> That's the word for being Greekized. That's not a word I know, but made, it's sort of, um, uh, we could say, think people are Americanized. Uh, that is, they learn the culture, the language, the ways. The best thing you know about a person who was a foreigner who is assimilated into a new country and a new culture is, do they understand the idioms and the, and the cultural ways and sort of the subtleties of any society that someone who lives there? Well, uh, there were really very quite separations among the Jewish people. And it began um, in the 100s, maybe 200s BC, when Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire took over uh, from the Persians. And the Romans didn't really mind how the Greeks had set things up in a lot of ways and really respected the Greek mind and language and so forth. So they didn't try to change everything. They added things that 
uh, the Roman Empire had. But a lot of the world was Hellenized, including Jews who were dispersed all over the Roman Empire, literally every place in the Roman Empire. And there was a constant struggle between the Hebraic Jews, primarily in Judah, Judea, Jerusalem and the um, area right around it, and the Hellenistic. And the Hellenistic spoke Greek, read the Greek Old Testament called the Septuagint, and they uh, practiced Greek cultures and dress and language. They spoke Greek. Um, they were Jews, and they were practicing and ortho orthodox in many regards, but they were Hellenized. The Hebraic Jews read Hebrew, spoke Hebrew, and lived in Judah and Jerusalem, and they were better than the other guys, and there was constant clash. Many on the day of Pentecost who came in that 3,000 and then added daily were Hellenistic Jews added to the Hebraic Jews. All these brand new Christians were Jews. And when you put two opposite groups, Democrats and Republicans in the same room, any subject you bring up, whether you want chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream, there's going to be a fight. And that was true of the church. And the work of the group that was now a very large body of believing Jews, Jews who were Christian, who were believers, a very large body of them, and they had the responsibility now to take over what used to be done by the temple in Jerusalem. Now, we're talking about people living in Jerusalem. It was the work of the temple and the taxes of the temple and the people, the priests and the people who worked in the temple to take care of, of widows and orphans. When you became a believer, you lost that. You were sort of off the welfare line and you had no more welfare check coming in, no more food stamps coming in, no more help, and but you were still a widow and you may have no resources. And it was the work of the church to take care of them and they were doing a good job, except Peter said, we, we can't do both things. And that's when we are introduced to this concept of when the Hellenistic Jews came to the Hebraic Jews and said, you aren't treating our widows and orphans and the dependents upon us, among us, you aren't treating them the same as you treat yours. And it's not fair. How did the church deal with its one first really big conflict? They gathered together, they prayed about it, and the Holy Spirit directed them to choose seven men to be deacons who had this ministry. This was now their ministry to take care of the day-to-day -day human needs of people. It would include more than just widows. It would include everything that was usually done, which we might put under the broad term social welfare type things. Take uh, who's sick, who needs to be taken care of, who needs to be um, food brought to, all those kinds of things. And literally, the apostles were working full time in the kingdom, doing the kingdom work, and they were uh, doing the teaching that this brand new church would have to have. We are now probably three years on from Pentecost, at least three years. And so they pick and then they choose with prayer. They uh, devote themselves to prayer and ministry, and that was the work of the apostle. And so they uh, got together, they agreed upon things. 
uh, they refer to themselves as brothers and sisters in, in verse six, uh, six, chapter six, verse three. Uh, this is an important concept too, because brothers and sisters are from the same father. And that's the picture of the church. We have one father who begat through the Lord Jesus, obviously, it's through salvation. We belong to the kingdom. We are like siblings, and we can call each other brothers and sisters. And that was a brand new thing among Christians, because the, uh, the Jews didn't speak that way. They were tribal. These are, you are my brother and my sister. It's familiar to Baptists. We, we call pastors often, you'll hear us old folks, will call pastors brother so-and-so, brother so-and-so. That, that's very um, Christian, brand new New Testament Christian. And so they were to pick seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, who can be appointed to this duty. And they list them and the uh, first one on the list is Stephen, who was a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and then Philip and Prochorus and Nicander, Tim and Parmius and Nicholas, and uh, who was a convert from Antioch, a fast-growing area of believers in a town up in Syria. And so we end chapter six pretty much, or or, or in that conversation pretty much in, in chapter six, verse seven. So after that dispute was settled and things got on and the ministries that needed to be taken care of were being taken care of, the word of God spread. The disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number. They're still called disciples, that is, followers of Jesus. And a large group of priests. Oh, no. The priest? Wow. The priest became obedient to the faith. The priest. These were, now, the Hellenistic uh, weren't such that wasn't such a surprise to them, but the Hebraic Jews had a real problem with this, and they got very concerned. So we need to know that there is a way to settle any dispute, and the Holy Spirit is there to guide and direct how it should be done, even the daily ministrations of people's needs, and so it was. Uh, a new concept was born, men appointed to the duty of taking care of the ministries of the church so that the pastor is free to um, uh, offer themselves in prayer and ministry of the word. If your pastor is doing all of the everyday ministries of the church, you're not going to have a pastor prepared in the word. Just works out. We're human. We can only do so much. I don't want to spend any more time of that. One of these people, Stephen, introduced to us in the end of chapter six there, is described as full of grace and power and was performing great wonders and signs among the people, that is miracles. And huh, opposition arose. Well, it always does. When one person is getting all the fame, so to speak, and we don't like it because our power, our resources may be um, challenged. And these folks called the Freedmen Synagogue. These would be where the Hellenistic Jews would, their synagogue. And they would do things a little bit different. And this would be like, you have the Baptist on one corner and the Methodist on another corner. They're similar in a lot of ways, but they don't mix. They don't do the same thing. We don't sing the same songs. We don't have the same kind of worship service. We have different programs. With 
If they're the body of the of Christ, they should easily mingle, but they don't. The Jews had Hellenistic synagogues separate, and there were probably 500 synagogues in Judah, Judea at this time. It was like, you know, like we do in Florida, a lot of churches everywhere, all different kinds. And the Africans, the North Africans, were probably, this was probably their synagogue, and that would be very common, where you would have people who were similar to you, and you would get together and have your synagogue. And that was, that was very common. That's no problem with that, but they were very, this is how we're doing things, and you can't change us, and we don't want your um, outside changing us. And they were... Uh, arguing with Stephen, who was uh, apparently worshiping with them, um, a part of hip part. Of, he was probably part of the one over their synagogue area, who was uh, in ministry. And if they had any widows or orphans or needs or so forth, he would be their deacon, so to speak. And they didn't like the way he was doing it, apparently. They argued with him, but it says in verse 10, they were unable to stand up against his wisdom and the spirit by whom he was speaking. Not fun when you lose the debate because you have to start thinking, who's right, me or him? And you have to choose sides. And if I choose him, then that puts me sort of under, so to speak, or I give to or give way to. Whereas if I'm right, you have to change and come to my way and I have the power. And it is always a problem. They didn't like what he was saying about Moses and God. Stephen was talking apparently about Jewish history, including Moses and God. And they didn't like it, so they took him to the Sanhedrin. Now, you know, the Sanhedrin is the governing body in Jerusalem. It's the 70 men, and the one who runs it is the chief priest. And at this time, it was probably still Caiaphas. Although there was a time at the end of Caiaphas we are now about 33 or so A.D., so it may be uh, a, a time when this was changed, but he may be the same one. And um, they came and said, we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses handed down to us. Now, do you think Stephen was preaching that? So one of our clues is if someone is trying to get, attack the church or the people in the church who are speakers, what is the first clue that this is a satanic attack is when they distort or lie about what's actually being said. So we need to find out really what is being said. That is the biggest problem we have today. We don't can't trust anything anybody says in public hardly. So, uh, but the the real giveaway is as soon as they put up their indictments against Stephen in verse fifteen, all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin, these 70 men who ruled the roost, and it was like the Supreme Court kind of thing, what they said would go, period, there would be no recourse. They looked intently at him, that Stephen, and saw what his face was like, the face of an angel. Was Stephen bothered by standing in front of the Sanhedrin with an accusation against him? Absolutely not. He had an angelic face. And the high priest, probably Caiaphas, says, is this true? 
And I, I hope they were sitting down because this was going to be a sermon to die for. This was the sermon. And I use this as an example now. This is how Luke often will, and he has, I think is like seven or nine sermons that he quotes like this in the book of Acts to explain history, people, events, and things that are going on in the church and how God settled it. And so this is, um, an, it's not the first one, Peter's are recorded before this, but this is an absolutely fascinating sermon. We don't have time to go through it in detail, but um, it has some unique things. And I think Peter, who would have been in town and very much familiar with what is going on, was thinking of this when he wrote... In 1 Peter chapter 3, always be ready to give a defense for the hope that is with why we believe what we believe. And Stephen was ready. Now, he would have been a real important um, sort of trophy for Peter. We don't read anything about Peter here because he is evidence that the apostles are have done a very good job, obviously led by the Holy Spirit, of teaching these new believers. Stephen might have been there among the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. And he is obviously well-schooled in the Old Testament scriptures as well, but he has learned how the Old Testament was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus and the work that he did. And that was what the uh, apostles were tasked to preach about. So he begins with brothers and fathers. There were probably Christians in the room observing all of this, and the fathers would be the Sanhedrin. They would be like, your honor, Supreme Court, justice so and so your honor uh this was uh his he is very um respectful and and good listen the glor the god of glory this is there is one other time in all of scripture the whole of the bible that that term the god of glory and that's in psalm 29 the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. And look where he begins. And I want to use this as um, an example that uh, Luke will mention and Paul and almost all the New Testament writers will trace the story of redemption, which Jesus finished on the cross but the story of redemption begins with abraham for every one of these men that are writers in the new testament they're all jewish luke knew of it even though he was probably not jewish he was gentile they knew of it and they all begin with that promise given to abraham by god in chapter 12 uh, which outlines the original uh, Abrahamic covenant, we call it, the promise given to Abraham, and it becomes the foundation that God builds his plan upon. This was his plan, and it is um, in this unfolding of that covenant with Abraham that we see that trusting or believing what God promises becomes the basis of being declared righteous. Remember in, in Genesis 15, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. That's where they all go back to. And we'll come back to that in a minute. So he begins there too. Stephen begins there too. Nobody in the room would not understand what he was talking about. They would know firmly what he was talking about. 
and he goes through and he goes through his, history and there's some things in history that uh, are made clearer in Stephen's uh, sermon or speech that makes clear some of the Old Testament things, uh, some of the timings and so forth. And he has it all uh, listed out there. He doesn't go very far. He goes as far as Moses, and then that's pretty much the history. He doesn't go past, well, Solomon. He gets up to building the temple with Solomon. But he goes through this whole speech. And he gets through um, the, talking about Solomon building the temple and what God had to say about it. And those are all recorded in, in the Old Testament scripture. And then he gives them with the zinger. Chapter 7, verse 51. Here's the zinger. This is, you're going to die for this, Stephen. <laughs> you stiff necked people that was the term god gave them back in sinai with moses you stiff necked people with uncircumcised hearts meaning you are not believers you're not part of god's covenant of faith you are out uh and uncircumcised hearts and ears you are what always resisting the holy spirit he's talking to the sanhedrin who don't even believe in the holy spirit but that's essentially saying you aren't even believing or you're pushing it back against god and he refers to him as the Holy Spirit. Just as your ancestors did, you do also. When, verse 54, when they heard these things, they were enraged and gnashed their teeth at him. Now we have a mob, a violent mob, a mob who is out of control and no reasoning is going to get to them. When they heard it, they gnashed their teeth at Stephen. Stephen, however, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven. And he saw, here we go again, the glory of God. And now that would be the Shekinah glory. And that is the, the light of the throne that you can't see God on the throne. You just see his light. That's the Shekinah glory of God. And what Jesus standing at the right hand of God. That would be the glorified, resurrected, having ascended at least three or more years before this. Where is he standing at the right hand of God? And Stephen said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Well, that did it. They couldn't take it anymore. They could not take this kind of truth. Talk about you can't handle the truth. They can't handle the truth. And they covered their ears and rushed against him and dragged him out of the city and stoned him. Why is this recorded in the book of Luke? Because there was a young man standing nearby and they said, here, hold my coat as they ran to gather stones and stone Stephen. So a young man named Saul was witnessing what was going on. He had probably heard Stephen's sermon. What was Saul doing there in the city of Jerusalem at this particular time? Because Saul was born in Tarsus, raised in Tarsus, his older sister, probably married and having a child at this time, was living in Jerusalem, and Saul was sent there 
by his parents to the university <laughs> to be trained. And he was so brilliant and such a, a bright student. He was chosen and they only chose one per uh, rabbi of the Sanhedrin. And Gamaliel chose Saul to sit at his feet and he would teach him the scripture for a year, just one-on-one -on -one student daily teaching. And it was absolutely the best education you could get. And Saul was a very young man and he was, um, we read this in other places that he was there um, observing and learning and look what he saw, look what he saw it would be a challenge to his professor who was sitting in the 70. It wasn't the Sanhedrin who stoned him. It was the people who were around and observing all of this who stoned him. Sanhedrin didn't stop him. But Stephen gives us a lesson about how to die under any circumstances, violent or otherwise. He called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. That is absolutely trusting in the salvation and resurrection and afterlife of the believer. I am absolutely convinced that you, Lord Jesus, hear me, and you will take my spirit to be with you. And he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, don't hold this against them. He understood they didn't know what they were doing, just like Jesus did. He died. After saying that, he just died. His spirit was instantly with the Lord. And that was all that really Saul saw. But we read when he became Paul and he was writing about it. And Luke records three accounts of the conversion. And some of those accounts will recall how he observed Stephen um, dying. It never left Paul never left it. This was indelibly the thing that the Holy Spirit used to wheedle in and wheedle in and wheedle in and convict this man. Um, Terry? Yes. Go ahead. And when you said that they threw, uh, they laid their robes at his feet, at Saul's feet. Are they following him? Is that what that means? Oh, no. Um, th today, when somebody's getting ready to get in a fight in a bar, here, hold my beer kind of thing. At least that's what I hear they say. I don't, I've never done that. I'm not sure by experience that's the way it works, but I hear, and I see it on TV here, hold my beer. Here, hold my jacket, because it's hard to throw stones when you've got your... Okay. So that's what has meant. nothing. No, they are not following. And Paul isn't seeing it that way either. He's just, he's a young man observing what's going on. He didn't participate in this particular event, but he saw it start to finish. Okay. Yes. Does that help, Christine? Yeah. Thank okay. you. So it does, however, in chapter eight, Saul agreed with putting him to death. Why would somebody want to kill Stephen? He was there to be their helper and do good things for them and good deeds. What was, what was the problem? It is the same problem today. People don't want to hear the truth about who the Lord Jesus is. If it challenges what your idea is about who God is and how he does things. If it's a challenge, that means I have to make a choice. I'm wrong and you're right, or you're wrong and I'm right. And some people do not handle I'm wrong very well. And that's true even today. So let's go on, and I don't want to spend a lot of time with this, but during this time, 
and we'll talk about him in just a minute. James, the half-brother of Jesus, is part of the leadership of this church that is going through this particular event of the stoning of Stephen, because the, everyone in the church would know this. All the thousands would know this, even though uh, those who were in Jerusalem would know this immediately. And uh, James would have been part of this. And Peter and all of the apostles would have, would have seen this. And we know that James, the half-brother of Jesus, is numbered among the 120 that were in the house on the day of Pentecost. So uh, all of these people are now observing, oh, the, the earth has shifted under our feet. This isn't complaining about the widows anymore. This isn't something that we can just collect, uh, uh, you know, get a, choose a bunch of guys and say, okay, you do these things and it'll all be taken. No. This is a ground shifting, life changing event in the church. And it's about 33 or 34 AD. That is, this is not very long after. And the church is still brand new. But how, what is the response? And this is what we need to learn from this that Luke is trying to record as part of the history of the church. What do you do when a horrible event, when the bomb drops in the middle of the group and everything changes, everything from one minute to the next, everything is different. The ground is shifted under your feet. What do you do? <clears throat> On that day, chapter 8, that day, the day that Stephen was stoned, that day, severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout the land of Judah, or Judea is a Roman Latin term, and Samaria. They had to run for their lives. Because when one Christian, like Stephen, if that's what we're going to do to Christians, and that's what they're going to do to us as believers, we need to run and get scattered. You think God had a plan to have Stephen stoned? What was the effect of the stoning of Stephen? The church was scattered. Connect in your mind for the rest of the New Testament. Persecution means growing church. meaning spreading, growing. Persecution means growing church. If there is no persecution of the church, there is no growth of the church. And that was the thing that uh, the Holy Spirit teaches us by the writer Luke in this event that he's recording here. Generally, by Jewish law, the person stoned is not buried in a normal way of burial. They're just left under the pile of rocks, and that's it, because it is a disgrace to be stoned like that. You're stoned because of blasphemy. You're not worth burying. But the Christian men, probably the other six men who were selected with him as deacons, got together, buried him, and mourned over him. With this event, how did Saul react? He's now, he's, we call him Paul, but he's at this point is still named Saul. Saul would be his um, Hebrew name. Saul was ravaging the church. That's what he said. Oh. That's what we're supposed to do to these 
blasphemous Christians. We're supposed to kill them, get rid of them. They are blasphemy against God and his temple and his people. We have to get rid of them. And he literally went to their houses and dragged them out of their houses, men and women, and put them in prison where they would be held until they died or be killed uh, shortly after. So, well, what do the scattered people do now? Now we have another person who's going to tell us through Luke's writing what scattered people do. These are the scattered Christians. What do scattered Christians do? Well, Philip. He's the uh, a fellow of the seven who were chosen to be ministers, and he is cho he went to the city of Samaria. Well, he's a Jewish man in a foreign country, so to speak, because Samaria, is, no Jews would ever choose to go there. But Philip went there. He literally fled from persecution, and he was sent to the city of Samaria. And what did he do? He proclaimed the Messiah to them, the Messiah, the anointed one, Jesus. He preached, and he also did miracles, and those miracles confirmed that his, what he was saying was God's way of confirming that he was telling them the truth, and there was a big revival going on in the city of Samaria, and there was great joy in that city. We read about the... Uh, the bad guy, Simon, who, not real sure about him, but he believed Philip and he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. Um, um, that's what Philip was doing. He was good news about the kingdom of God, this is verse 12, and the name of Jesus both men and women. That's the important uh, message that we get. The kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, who he is and what he came to do and how to, how to get into God's kingdom. Remember Jesus said how we are to get into the kingdom of God? He told uh, Nicodemus in John 3, you must be born again. To, that's what he was teaching that's what he was preaching the good news about the kingdom and the name of jesus um the apostles heard about this they came and laid hands on i'm not going to go into the, there's a lot of things that we'll have to go over because of time we just can't but um philip preached and there was a revival in the city and many came uh into the kingdom were believers they received the Holy Spirit. They uh, uh, began a church there, you would say, a, a local church. And what does uh, Philip do? Well, he settled down. He said, I'll be the pastor of the church, and you can take up a collection and support me and my family. He had daughters, um, and he, you know, no, that's not what it says. When, it, when the revival was going good and there was joy in the city, the angel of the Lord said, Philip, get up and go to the road south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. That's right in the middle of the desert. That's at the bottom of what we would call Israel today. On the way to Gaza, Nobody wants to go to Gaza. That's, you know, just was a, a, a dirty, big, dirty city at that time, too. So the spirit took him there. And what was on that road? Here's another way that Luke is telling us how the Holy Spirit is working. He had just been preaching to people in Samaria about the kingdom and the name of, of Jesus, and he is literally whisked away 
not in his own power, <laughs> onto a road, and there's a single man, a man from Ethiopia, an African, who happens to be a eunuch, and he had come to Jerusalem perhaps to worship, but he was on two accounts, a foreigner and a eunuch, and would not be able to get into the temple to worship, but he had somehow get, gotten a scroll of the book of Isaiah. And he's sitting in his chariot. Now, he is a, a very wealthy person. He's second in command only to the queen of Ethiopia. He's her right-hand man, I guess, so the supporter, maybe the vice president, the vice queen, vice king, whatever, right under the queen. And he is uh, would travel in entourage with a chariot. He was in his chariot, and they were riding back to get back home to Ethiopia, and this is the way you would have to go. And so Philip goes and catches up because the spirit said, go speak to him. And Philip goes, do you understand what you're reading? So this is also the work of a disciple to teach what the word says. If you know what it says, you are to teach. Tell other people what it says. And, and this Ethiopian man is reading from Isaiah 53. A lot of people have come to the Lord from Isaiah 53. He's reading Isaiah 53, and um, the man said, well, I'm reading this. Is this the one who's writing here? Is he referring to himself being the uh, one slaughtered, or is he referring to somebody else? Talking about, is Isaiah writing about himself, or is he writing about somebody else? He's reading this, but he's not understanding what he's reading or what the impact. Verse 35 of chapter 8. Philip proceeded to tell him, this man, the good news about Jesus, beginning with that scripture. This is Old Testament. This, there's no New Testament even written yet. He began with Isaiah's passage, and he told him the good news about Jesus. Did it work? Did the spirit work in this uh, Ethiopian man? We get a whole lot of information by the response. Look, here's water. Well, there wouldn't be naturally a body of water there big enough to baptize somebody in. Um, just a word here. I got a note that my internet connection, which is Wi-Fi here at the church, is unstable. If I lose you, just hang on. Hopefully, we'll stay there. A lot of people getting on at one time, maybe. <laughs> so this man says, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? That was the original message of Peter. Repent and be baptized. That is, become a believer and be baptized. They went together, always went together. What is the baptism? This is water baptism that he's speaking about here. It is an expression of I understand the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. I'm expressing it in my own uh, action of being baptized. Well, this eunuch went on to Ethiopia, and we never hear from him again. Not a word. I'm sure there's a DVD in heaven, and we're going to get to sit down and talk to him and say, okay, and then what happened? And then what happened? And how did this happen? And but we do know the absolute value of this little vignette of experience because Ethiopia today in February of 2021 is the only Christian nation in the continent of Africa 
there are Christians in other countries, but it is listed as a Christian as opposed to being surrounded by the Muslims, which it is. And today, or actually it was Monday, it may have been Friday, um, Samaritan's Purse airplanes took off and went to Ethiopia with food and medicine and other kinds of supplies. You know, they fill up their whole airplane as much as they possibly can get and take a team with them. And they landed in um, Ethiopia. Addis Ababa, I believe, is the airport they went because there is a war today between the Muslims and the Christians. That's 2,000 years on from Philip's encounter with this man. Did it take? He went home and evangelized his own country. That's God's work. That's how he works. That's what he does. From there, we go to chapter nine, and I'll briefly go through this because we'll need to come back to it. I've got to try to get to James. Oh, my. Yeah. He would, uh, the practice of the um, Pharisees was to bring up the brightest, the best and the brightest to be Sanhedrin members. That is the highest echelon of judicial law, uh, religious law, uh, the administration of the country of Israel. It was to bring up uh, the best and brightest and put them in positions like the Sanhedrin or others to be the leadership of, of Israel. And he measured up to that because he was chosen to be at the feet of Gamaliel. So this would be their graduate training, so to speak, and he would come out of there assured to be uh, in the leadership of the nation of Israel. Remember, he said, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Of the tribe of Benjamin, he could trace his heritage back to King Saul. That may have been his namesake. So he was absolutely an up-and-coming young man with much promise. Let me read to you before we go to his conversion. I read, a, I found a description because we, you know, we don't have exactly a little snapshot of what he looked like, but uh, a historian, which is not named, I think quoted by Josephus, said, uh, he was described as bald, bow-legged, strongly built, small in statue, stature, I guess, with large eyes and meeting eyebrows, <laughs> and a longish nose, full of grace, sometimes looking like a man, sometimes having the face of an angel. That's a description of him later on. He knew the scriptures absolutely, without question. He was an expert. He was a graduate student in the scriptures. So he would, he would know um, if somebody was set, quoting it incorrectly or making the wrong. And their method, their, their teaching method, the Gamaliel method, was argument. You make an argument for your position. You learn to argue from your position, why you're right, why your, your understanding of this word of scripture is correct. And you had to argue it. And the professor who was long since had learned all those arguments would challenge and ask questions. And there was it was a grilling grueling kind of an education but when you came out of it you were an expert in the law and the prophets and the scriptures 
So he could rightly declare himself as a um, Pharisee of the Pharisees. I was, I graduated as a, as an expert. So, chapter nine, Paul, now I'm calling Paul, he's Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And he went to the high priest that he would have known him personally to the high priest. And the high priest would have known him because of his position with Gamaliel. And he requested letters from the high priest uh, to go to the synagogues in Damascus. This would be where a lot of the Christians had fled to to avoid persecution, and there was now a huge um, group of people who were believers in the city of Damascus, which is Syria, way up, way up outside of uh, the so-called um, Israeli border. They would, the, um, he would have to have special papers to get there and to arrest them and bring them all back. And he said, I want to find men or women who belonged to the way. That was what the uh, movement, the Jesus movement was called, the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so, and I want to bring them back to Jerusalem as prisoners. Now, you aren't going to, uh, you know, get your walking stick and walk up there by yourself to, to Damascus to do this. You're going to take a an entourage of soldiers and you're going to go by horseback and you're going to have provision to bring back a large number of people. So all of this would have to have been planned, financed, worked out, and that's what he was doing on this uh, trip. So he traveled and as he was coming to Damascus, the uh, Luke records a lot of details for one purpose. He wants to tell us the story of Paul's conversion. Because we're going to get two more copies of this conversion told by Paul himself. Uh, and they would be to different groups and they will emphasize different things. But he wants to tell, Luke is now using this particular story to tell of the early church What's going on in the early church? This is now about 35 AD. We're, we're just a little bit longer. The church has been under severe persecution, and uh, but they are, Philip is going out. People are being saved. There's a very dynamic church in um, Damascus. There's, everything's going on, but um, it's, it's under persecution. So he has, uh, um, uh, it demonstrates God's sovereign will too. That was a, a doctrinal thing that Luke is kind of hiding in here because here is a, a single person, Saul, amongst a entourage of soldiers sent by and financed by the high priest with all the uh, supplies and equipment they would need to round up Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem. And the trip from Jerusalem to Damascus is still 150 miles <laughs> because of the route that you have to take. It's um, above uh, the Golan Heights and all that is way up um, north of, of Jerusalem. So they come and near, near Damascus, it's probably within maybe sight of the city up there. And Damascus is one of, is probably the oldest city on earth, continuously existing city on earth. Uh, it's mentioned in, in um, uh, Genesis early on. So it's a, it's a very old city and established city in um, Damascus, Syria. And uh, it says, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. This is, uh, Paul later says, this was noon, and it was brighter than the noon sun. There is only one source of light brighter than the sun in the universe. 
and that is the Shekinah glory of God. So when this light flashed, it threw him off his horse to the ground, and there was a voice from that light, hmm, burning bush type situation here. Saul, listen, listen carefully to this. This is the Lord Jesus speaking. Saul, Saul, when you mention it twice, that is, I'm going to tell you something. You better listen. This is important. Why are you persecuting me? In that statement, what is the most important one word, would you say? Me. There's a voice. He sees a light and hears a voice and it says, why are you persecuting me? But I'm on my way to persecute those Christians in Damascus. <laughs> Who are you? And he uses that uh, word with the small letters, meaning like um, it, it is like, sir. Uh, Who are you, sir? Like a respect sign, but not you know, not speaking as if it's the Lord Jesus. How does Jesus respond? I am. Ooh, I am. He spoke to Saul in Hebrew. And when he said, I am, he's saying, Yeshua. Yahweh, Yeshua. I'm God. I am is God. I am, I am. Same thing he said to Moses. That's my name. God. I am the one you are persecuting. And Jesus could have just stomped him right there and finished the persecution of that for that time. But no, what he did, get up and go into the city, and you will be told what to do. Well, he's kind of got the wind knocked out of him. He's got the sight knocked out of him, and he's got the sense knocked out of him. What in the world is going on? What happened? What happened? What happened? Now, this is a very bright young man who's on a mission and he has suddenly been stopped by the Lord Jesus himself. He had probably been traveling for several days. Even on horseback, it would have taken a, a few days. And they were nearing their journey's end. And he was probably, okay, let's get in there and get this job done, get back, back to Jerusalem. He was arrested by Jesus instead of Paul arresting Christians. Jesus arrested him. Paul was a broken man. He was blinded. He was led by hand and put in a house and left there. And he was in such dismay and brokenness that he refused to eat. And he just laid there. That was how he, he was shaken to his core. Did the Lord leave him there like that? No. He had prepared a fella by the name of Ananias, who was a disciple in Damascus. That's all we know. He's a man who was a follower of Jesus who lived in Damascus, and he gets a message from the Lord. You've got to go and speak to this man, Saul. Um, hang on a minute, Lord. You remember that he's the one who's trying to kill us all. Just want to make sure <laughs> he's told exactly where to go and which house it's to be on the street, the, the house, and the name of the man. And um, after the discussion between he and the Lord, Ananias goes, and he goes, he said, the Lord um, told Ananias, go, for this man is my chosen instrument. 
to take my name to the Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So, Ananias gets up and goes to the street call straight to the house of Judas and says, where is this man from Tarsus named Saul? They, he's taken to him and he addresses him how? Brother. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road you were traveling, has sent me. Now, remember, Paul is blind, so he can't, he doesn't know anything about Ananias at this point. He doesn't know anything. He's just still in kind of shock, I guess, and broken. He sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. You think he did? He said, I've got some good news for you and some bad news. You're going to get your sight and you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but you're going to have to go to the Gentiles and you're going to find out how much you must suffer for my name. Paul refers to this many times in his letters. We need to look at every letter written by Paul in terms of this experience. This was his molding experience. His whole perspective has changed now. Remember, Luke is a doctor, so he explains things a little bit because he's a doctor. He said something like scales or flakes or scabs fell off his eyes. That's all we know. And he regained his sight. He got up and was baptized. Woo! Does that confirm to you that as soon as you're born again, you need to be baptized? That is really over and over in, in the New Testament. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Then we uh, will get to the story of how he is trained. We'll get to uh, uh, talk about that a little bit more at a, uh, another time. I'll, I'll come back to that when we get to Galatians. But I want to, because we're out of time, I want to just spend a minute or two on the book of James as we can only do overviews of these letters. But there are a couple of things about when you read these just five short chapters written here. Um, Number one, we need to think about who wrote them and to whom he writes them, because that's true for every letter that we're reading. And when you read letters, who writes a letter and to whom is he writing the letter? And often what is stated as the reason I'm writing you this. And that's what uh, we do with James. Because while all this stuff is going on with Paul, James is in Jerusalem and has been since Pentecost, probably. He is married. He probably has children. He has, uh, we know that he has three other brothers that are listed in scripture and at least two sisters because it has an S with sisters. He's got more than one sister, so we don't have their names, uh, but we have um, a record that he had uh, siblings who probably um, would be in and around Jerusalem, maybe would go uh, back up to Galilee on occasion, but um, he's from a large family, all of them are believers. All of them are in the church. All of them are known by the apostles. They grew up together. Some of them are cousins, you know. So they, it's, it's uh, very, they're very familiar with who he is. All we know is that James, the half brother of Jesus, by the way, his Hebrew name is Yaakov or Jacob. James is a uh, Roman name. Jacob, 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 which I think is very interesting. Um, he uh, also was called James the Just. Um, he is the elder of the church in Jerusalem. 
and we'll come to that next week with uh, chapter 15. We'll confirm his position there. He would have met Paul three years or so after his conversion one-on-one -on -one and heard this, but James was very much a leader in Jerusalem, very trusted. He apparently was equipped with the um, administrative work as well. Um, it is not clear that he would be the preacher because the apostles were there in Jerusalem and probably were the ones who were doing the so-called preaching if they were doing uh, teaching and so forth in the church. But he is um, a very much a uh, leader um, in the church in Jerusalem. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 5, if you want to just write, it tells us that he was married and that he um, would have a family. And he would have, as I said, was in the house at Pentecost. And he would have uh, been very much aware of the big dispersion of all these people that happened when Stephen was stoned and would have said, we've got to keep in touch and keep track of what's going on and what do they need and how can we help when they're scattered all over the place. And he would have set up a network perhaps um, and so forth. And so he is writing to this group of what is called the diaspora of Messianic Jews. That is Jews who believe in Jesus which was most of them in the beginning. Most of the believers in Jesus were Jews. There were a few Gentiles probably, but very few at this time. One was an Ethiopian and he was down in Ethiopia. So, um, but he would have been there and who he's concerned about are all those thousands of people who have fled all over the Roman empire and, um, he had several concerns that he had identified when he wrote this letter. As with every letter, there is an issue that needs to be addressed. And the letter may have at least one, it may be several issues which will be addressed. And they are informative. They are uh, teaching letters. They are not, hi, how are you doing? Here's the latest going on in my family, what's the latest going on in your family, kind of Christmas cardy type uh, uh, letters. These are very serious. And he had identified some issues. So let's look at the very first beginning, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus. Well, how did that happen? We know from the Gospels that he did not believe that Jesus was the Christ until a one-on-one -on -one meeting after the resurrection between he and James, Jesus and James one-on-one -on -one by themselves. What a meeting that must have been. And, and James became a believer and he became a servant referred to here as a bond servant one who chooses to be a servant and he refers to him as the lord jesus christ he doesn't say my big brother even though he was <clears throat> and he grew up with him as a child <clears throat> who does he write the 12 tribes dispersed abroad well, I thought 10 of them were lost. Isn't that what the history people tell us? You know, those 10 tribes that were lost? Uh-uh. There are no lost tribes. And James, of course, knew it. 12 tribes dispersed abroad, meaning there are people from every tribe who were Messianic believers, every tribe, all 12 tribes here. None of them were lost. <clears throat> and he says, greetings. Okay, that's your only 
happy thought here, greetings. <laughs> How you doing? And then he says, here's the statement, consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience this persecution, these trials, because here's the reason why we are being persecuted. This is now with a little bit of perspective. It is probably written about 43 AD, meaning about 10 years or so after Stephen's stoning. So we've got some time here and some perspective, and people have been out living in the provinces all around the Roman Empire for nearly 10 years. They're not, there's still a very few, <clears throat> says the apostles remained in Jerusalem, but most people fled because of the persecution. And the persecution was from other Jews, by the way. It wasn't from the Romans, it was from the other Jews. <clears throat> Here's the reason why you should be joyful in experiencing these trials, because this testing of your faith produces endurance. And when, let this endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. What we need here is grown up, strong Christians. That's what the church needs. <clears throat> we need grown ups who, and endurance comes from exercise, from doing. <clears throat> and that's really what his, his, uh, his teaching is all about. Being a doer of the word and not a hearer only is his. And sometimes they <clears throat> refer to this book as a Proverbs, like a Proverbs or a book of wisdom. Uh, many of the uh, passages in this book uh, sound very much like the Sermon on the Mount kind of teaching and refers to some of the topics that the Lord Jesus spoke about in the short Sermon on the Mount, which makes me think he was there and heard it, but he didn't respond to his own brother's teaching. So I, that's speculation. We don't know that. <clears throat> but what we need is this church is going to need elders, those who've been tested and their faith has been tested and it is sound and mature and ready to be um, useful in the kingdom. Look at the beatitude that he uses to describe this, and it's almost a direct quote from Isaiah 28, but he says in verse 12 of chapter 1, blessed is the one who endures trials, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. That is almost the same thing that the Lord Jesus said at the end of the list of Beatitudes, blessed, blessed, blessed. For the reward, your reward is in heaven. And it's a great reward that is in heaven. That's what Jesus said. That's what we're going. We're going through all of this to get the reward in heaven, not here on earth. Our reward's in heaven. And this, there's uh, several passages in the scripture that talk about um, reward as, in terms of a crown. But look at this one, the crown of life. Now turn in, and I didn't get the actual uh, uh, page, but Revelation 2.10, I'll just give you that as a, this is in the letters to the churches written in the beginning of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2. And this is the, the, the church um, at uh, Smyrna. And it says in verse chapter 2 of Revelation, I, that's 1385 in your little Bible. Um, uh, but it's, it's speaking at the end of it, it says, 
to this church, the Lord Jesus is speaking when he writes, don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Revelation is still talking about suffering. People of faith are still going to be suffering in Revelation. This is Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you, and you will, be ha will have affliction for 10 days. Be faithful unto death. And I, the Lord Jesus, will give you the crown of life. Same thing, isn't it? So there was a clear understanding that life as a Christian is going to be full of trials and persecution, and we are expected to endure and overcome and stay until death and then get our reward, the crown of life. I don't have much time to do this, but the book of James is the first book written for the New Testament, but it is the last book that was added to the canon. That is, when they selected all the books to go in at the um, uh, Council of Nicaea, they collected all the books and said, this one stays, this one goes, because many in the first 350 or 360 or so years, there were a lot of other books written by very good people, very important uh, works, and they can be obtained um, extra biblical. You, there are still uh, copies of them, but this was the last one to be included in the canon, and many fought against it, but the Holy Spirit won and put it in. And here's the problem, and it lasts even until today. The problem uh, exists even till today. What must I do to be saved? What is saving faith? And there was conflict, it seemed, between what Paul wrote and what James wrote. And they refer to that same covenant with Abraham, which is then quoted as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Both refer to that. That's why I say that's a foundational statement for the church as well as it was for um, the Jews. But in uh, the second chapter of James, the book of James, the second chapter of James, Chapter, uh, chapter 2, 14, all the way to the end of the chapter, which is verse 26. What good is it? This is James' posit to his diaspora, the people scattered all over the, all over the Roman Empire that he's concerned about who are assimilating and becoming too much like the world, getting greedy being unjust, gossipy, doing all kinds of things they should not be doing as a church. Remember, we're 10 years into the deal, and it's starting to show uh, the effects of world flesh getting into the church. Same problem today. Uh, he had said uh, up in the end of chapter one, pure and undefiled religion before God is to look after the orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. That was sort of, I'm the church administrator. I deal with this every day and I see what's going on in the world. And many Christians are not being just to people in the community. So there's a lot of stuff in this book, but let's look at the controversy. It depends on your translation, but what good is it, my brothers and sisters, this is verse 14 of chapter two, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works, can such faith 
save him. Oh, no. And that's what the folks in Nicaea were saying. Oh, no, this is what? Uh, this is very different than Paul. Paul in Ephesians, look at Ephesians 2, 8 and 10. I, uh, I don't want to get too much into that, but it essentially is you are saved by faith or good works. It's just stated a little differently, but you are saved by faith for good works. I'm making it short. And, and Galatians 3, 6, which we'll get to a little bit more, and I'll spend more time with it next time when we get to Galatians, says essentially the same thing, uh, referring, because later in chapter 2 of James, he refers to uh, uh, the Abraham statement about, or the statement about Abraham, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called as God's friend. That's what James says. Well, um, Galatians 3, uh, 6, just like Abraham who believed God and it was credited him for righteousness. And the discussion seems to be controversy or conflicting, the two, Paul and James. Now, let's just kind of step back one second and come to our principle. We trust that the Holy Spirit inspired every bit of Scripture, start to finish. And we trust that and we believe it by faith or we don't. Every bit of Scripture is inspired. It is God's word to us. Having that as your foundational thinking, you think God would, or the Holy Spirit would say, well, let me put conflicting things in there to confuse them and make them all crazy and think, well, let me side with Paul or let me side with James and create camps or tribes you think that would be the purpose of the holy spirit mm -hmm. so the way i look at this controversy and it is still a controversy in a lot of fields choosing sides the whole calvinist thing is by faith alone they use that word alone paul never uses that word alone that's a Calvinist strain or the uh, today's Reformed Church, so to speak, the Reformers. And there are a lot of good people there. But by grace alone, by grace through faith alone, that's all. Whereas uh, there are the more liberal arms of today's churches who will say, you have to have good works with your faith. And they choose sides. Do you think that would be the purpose of the Holy Spirit? There's one unified body of Christ. There's one faith, one baptism, one God, one Holy Spirit. There's all through that, there's one thing. So there must be a problem on our side because it ain't on the Holy Spirit side. That's where I begin. If I'm confused, it's my problem. And James and Paul are not saying things different or opposite or opposing or conflicting. They're addressing different groups and they're saying things in a different way to say the same thing. And I struggle with how to even talk about this because we have such limited time, but I, I tried to kind of look at it in, in this way. James was saying, you say you have faith, but you are treating people badly, unjustly. You're greedy, you're selfish, you put yourself above the poor and things like that. I don't think you are of the faith. I don't think you are because your life doesn't express it. That's what he was saying. Like your, your work should express your faith. Well, Paul is saying we are, grace is the thing that saves us. 
God's uh, faith and what God did for us, is, uh, that grace saves us. But it saves us to do good works. So they are connected. It's just written differently. So I put my bottom line as this, and this is where we'll have to quit. Comes down to, I believe that, and then you have things listed under there, or I believe in. If you believe that, and I listed a few things, you, if you believe that, it's the content. I believe that Jesus is the son of God. I believe that he died on the cross and he went and he's in heaven and he'll come again. Sort of the creed that people will say over, I believe all these things. And then they live their lives as if they're like anybody else. There's no difference between how they, they possess knowledge. They have it. But as opposed to the one who believes in, and it's very much like if I <clears throat> say, Erlene, would you come up here and sit in this chair? She would say, I believe that chair will hold me, so I will go sit in it. That's one thing. But if Erlene gets a, comes up and sits in the chair, she believes in the chair. I believe, and I'm going to prove, and I'm going to practice my belief, I'm going to sit in the chair, and it holds me. Does that make sense? Believing that and believing in. Confidence, trust, evidence comes out of your life that you are a believer. And it isn't just what you say. And James was very keen on trying to deal with problems that he was dealing with in the truth in the church in Jerusalem, as well as in all the tribes all over, scattered all over who had Messianic Jews. He was saying, you cannot treat other people badly and call yourself a believer. And they were treating people, they were greedy, they were unjust, they were gossipy. Remember the whole discussion about the tongue and so forth? They were gossipy. He underlines this with, uh, if you want wisdom, on how to do all of these things and how to interpret everything. He's got that discussion there. In chapter four of James, he says in verse uh, five, therefore, and there's a lot of therefores in James. He's saying, I've explained thing and therefore this, <clears throat> whatever, whoever wants to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. And that's what he was trying to say is, just because you say you believe in God and you act like everybody else and can't tell any difference between you and everybody else, you want to be a friend of God. Well, if you are a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. Submit to God, resist the devil. Talks about a, a lot of uh, like almost like Proverbs kinds of saying. He ends it in verse in chapter five and verse seven. His last chapter, he begins um, in verse seven with a therefore, brothers and sisters. He's written the whole thing, and he's he said brothers and sisters in the beginning, and he's still saying brothers and sisters, be patient. I told you to endure. You're going to have to endure hardship. Be patient. How long? Until the Lord's coming. So he was teaching about how long it's going to need. You need to be patient for because the Lord is coming. See how the Father waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient until it 
uh, the farmer uh, waits for the precious fruit of the earth and the patience uh, with it until it receives the early and the later rains. Well, from planting to harvest, you have to be patient and let it go through its course. You must also be patient, strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. Let's say that was written in 43 AD. That's how we're supposed to be thinking. That's why we need to be who we need to be. He then, I think, I love, I would, I just can't wait to meet James because I think he is such a unique and special person that is presented here. My brothers and sisters, this is the last two verses of chapter five and, and the book. If any among you strays from the truth, and someone turns him back. You know somebody who is this truth that is set out for us, that God has given us, the Lord Jesus has given us, if somebody somehow gets away from it, and you know it, and you turn them back, let that person know that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. That's the end of his book. So what is James interested in? Making a controversy between he and Paul? No. Galatians was probably written only two or three years after this. So, it, I mean, these two things were talked about amongst all the believers all over for years. It's still a controversy, but it shouldn't be. If you come from the point of view of what is the Holy Spirit teaching me in this setting that I need to know, I believe by faith it is inspired and is not meant to confuse me or be contradictory in any way. So I, that's how I settled the argument for myself. I just don't go there. And I, I believe that James, because of his life, he was killed um, by Judaizers, by the Jews in Jerusalem. He was killed in 62, it is felt. So he had a long ministry, and as far as we know, was all in Jerusalem through the whole time. So... Um, the foundation of the church in Jerusalem was very strong at its beginning. Okay, time to finish up. There's 